we are on a uh, exciting trajectory here with the Global Health Education Initiative. Uh, we are so appreciative of all of you who logged in last time to see our segment on fasting and dive into how we kind of reset human health. And today we're diving into a new topic that's largely supported by you all. And so we're so grateful for those of you that went to the GoFundMe site and uh, went to go ahead and donate uh, the money that's coming in through that's allowing us to hire new staff. You'll get to meet at the end of this presentation, Pete Cummings, doctor of tri also triple board certified with a background in neuropathology. He's the first hire that's being uh, enabled by your contributions to expand an incredible educational uh, opportunity for us to start bringing free content to the world to really start to bring an alternative narrative, an alternative voice to the extraordinary weight of media that's currently overwhelming the public globally with a story of fear. And we are excited as physicians and scientists to come to all of you with a story of regeneration, a story of a nature that we are born within that has a deep intention for human life to not just happen, but to adapt and to actually go beyond its current state, perhaps to even a higher level of functionality as we start to embrace the adaptation and biodiversification that is inherent to our biology. And so today as we dive in, it's really a, a witness to and a deep gratitude to the nature that we are born within. I want to take a moment to start this time off together uh, to focus in on the opportunity to create some silence. There's a cacophony of sound in the world right now that is, again is, is presenting this paradigm of fear, this paradigm of conflict with nature, conflict with the viruses, conflict with you know, governments and everything else. And, and I really want to take the opportunity to set the foundation for our discussion today with a moment of silence to recognize how much power comes between the words. For all the words that I'll speak today, I want you to set the intention that you will learn more about yourself, learn more about your sense of purpose here that you picked right now at the tipping point of human history. You picked now and you're gonna find that purpose. You're gonna find the resonance of the information you need to extract from today in line with that purpose as you go into the silence between my words, before my words, and after my words today. And so I'm really confident that when you wake up tomorrow, it will be what you learned in your sleep tonight that, that will really be the most important content that you'll move forward with. What is it that you're going to really resonate with and take and create as your own in the knowledge base that we're working on here? So let's join uh, together in silence. I'm thanks, so, so thankful for the 1,400 of you that have already logged on here uh, right now and for all 11,000 of you that are already signed up for this. I'm humbled by your presence all over the world uh, and I'm humbled by your time. It's the most precious thing that we have as humans with such finite lifespans that we have to give each other time and to create the opportunity for a co-creative space like we're working on today. I just am in gratitude to each of you. So let's take this time of silence and uh, if you would like to be invited to, I'd recommend you put your feet flat next to each other, uncross your legs if they're crossed, sit up straight, allow your shoulders to fall away from your ears, go ahead and close your eyes, maybe Rotate your neck a couple times, just loosen up the neck and upper shoulders there. Hunched over a computer if you are, then you're gonna sit up straight and, and push back a little bit away from your monitor. And let's go into a half a dozen deep breaths in and out at your own pace. And we'll be in silence for that.
All right. We're going to go ahead and begin the talk here. We're going to dive into really the origin of life as, as kind of a humble space to begin with here and as an intention to set for this talk. I hope that you walk away with a deeper sense of the miracle of life itself and what it feels like to be in that uh, kind of awestruck state of the fact that we are here in a biologic form, uh, encompassing these incredible souls that we all come in with and working on these soul purposes uh, expressed in the environment that we are um, playing through there. So. To, as we dive in, I want you to, to close your eyes, perhaps even between my words too. Don't feel compelled to have to, to watch through this entire lecture. But I want you to think about just the origin of, and complexity of the life that we're in. And I wish I could bring all of you into some of my experiences in birthing children. Birthing babies is one of the tr truly most extraordinary things I've ever done as a physician. And in the my study of anatomy, one of the things that uh, is an overwhelming experience in many ways is the study of fetuses. Uh, in your gross anatomy course, you are brought into contact with preserved fetuses that were uh, either naturally miscarried or aborted at different phases of development. And so you see everything from week one to that incredible 40 week preparation for emerging from the womb. And when you realize how early in that, that trajectory of, of the 40 weeks of gestation that we start to form all of the miraculous structures of our body and their exquisite design, uh, the eyeball being an amazing example, but the fingers, the toes, and everything else beyond, it's awe-inspiring that it works so well. How does, how does the hand figure out how to divide into 10 digits how, like, like this? How, how does it all function in such beauty? And it remains another mystery. Uh, science has not figured out how the body knows how to f follow this template, this three-dimensional template for the human body. How does a, a dolphin know how to become a dolphin? Uh, the genes that, that are our you know, foundation as told to us by Watson and Crick, it turns out, are only a semblance of the, of the template. They, they are a rough blueprint, but how we go to develop a, this three-dimensional body and go to then embody some sort of fourth or fifth dimensional consciousness within ourselves that can then move into these spaces of temporal and you know, quasi-quantum physics kind of environments of, of, of pointillism. We have to really realize that we are on a journey that is beyond description. So for all of the science that I wanna share with you today, I want us to, to keep it encircled in this sense of awe, this sense of we don't even know the beginning of the complexity, the beginning of the miraculous nature of life as we do it. And so we need to, as scientists, as consumers, as health consumers, be very conscientious of the fact that ultimately the medical science world knows nothing about how to interact with this miraculous thing that we call a human body. We are at best looking through the glass darkly, as scriptures say, at this thing that we call life. And so when you hear that we're coming out with new pharmaceutical solutions for anything, you need to take it with a huge grain of salt. We don't even understand how health occurs. We don't understand how a body forms itself. And so you and I as, as physician and consumers should take very big you know, caution to the hubris that we often practice in medicine. It's been astonishing over the last six months for me to see media people, journalists who have never taken a, a biology course perhaps in their lives, standing there in front of cameras talking to the entire world with such authority over, over their science, over the, their data, over this stuff that they're reporting as if they know what they're talking about. It's astonishing to me to see the, the hubris of the, the media, let alone the, the regulatory science communities of the NIH and the CDC and the WHO. I wish they started every single you know, conference with, we are amazed that there are human beings at all on the planet. It seems so few, far beyond miraculous in the, in the numerical possibilities that we are all thriving and, and growing as a population still. We need to start with that sense of awe and then move into our best guess is or our best effort towards instead of this is how it is and there's been 1,232,000 deaths from this disease. 
we never have that kind of clarity. We never know how many people are dying of what and for what reasons and for, for what pathology unfolds. COVID is just one of the many you know, conditions out there that, that are really wastebasket kind of diagnoses where it's encompassing all kinds of pathology being lumped into COVID or lumped into breast cancer, or all these different conditions that we put on death certificates. They're not accurate in the end. They're our best guess at a scenario of life, death, and everything that happens in between. So that's a long-winded journey into uh, I want you to take what I'm about to say with that same grain of salt for as good of the effort as I put forth and my team puts forth into the research to make sure that we're presenting the, the, the cutting edge data and the most backed up numbers and everything else, they're, they're still our best guess. They're still you know, a semblance towards the truth. And when I sit in populations in the Midwest and parts of the United States and the South, I'm concerned that even these numbers that I'm showing you now are way underestimating the burden of disease that we have coming down upon us. I think that we are uh, deluded by uh, our belief in health. And I see this all the time in the media, social media and beyond is we love to think that we're healthy right up until the moment we find out we're not. And then we blame the cancer that jumps up or the the neurologic injury or neurologic degeneration or whatever it is or the, or the COVID. And we, we blame these things for this sudden lack of health. But the reality is health happens all of the time and disease only happens when there's a failure of health. And so as we start to look through these numbers of the chronic disease epidemics that I've spoken to you so many times and so many of you are well aware of, we need to remember these aren't diseases that are attacking humanity. These are symptoms of a collapse of fundamental health within our species. And I would like to present the idea today that much of the collapse that we see of that health that then makes us vulnerable to the, the emergence of these disease epidemics is really a disconnect from mother nature, a disconnect and an isolation away from the original nature we were developed within. We have to be humbled by the, the, the sheer timeline of the planet, right? And so as we look at these numbers of autism in 1 in 36, and we see this graph on the right, you're looking at 1975 with 1 in 5,000 children with autism, to suddenly 2012, we've, we've climbed to, to 1 in 88 children with autism. And then if you jump to you know, the current day, uh, we see a doubling every kind of four years with that autism rate. And so that gives us a sense of you know, real crisis at hand. And all of these, as we double these rates, whether we're talking about autism all the way down to dementia, are focused on this gut-brain connection. There's this fundamental collapse of the microbiome that's being pointed to for all of these chronic disease conditions now that are, are, are coming forth. And so as we start to, I think, wrap our experience around the disease epidemics and the trajectory that we're on from 1975 to today with all of these exponential growth curves of these, the prevalence of disease, we need to always keep in mind the reverse graph, which is a, a, sud, a, a dire collapse of the biologic health that has kept us from these diseases in the past. It wasn't that there was no such thing as autism or no such thing as coronavirus or no such thing as diabetes and obesity in the 1960s. It's just that the health was at a level that there was no, no possibility for the emergence of these diseases to occur. And so when you see an exponential curve, whether it be chronic disease here or uh, a curve of, of you know, viral cases in the community or whatever it is, you need to remember that what you're really looking at is the reverse curve. You're watching a collapse in human health. And for these graphs and for this reality, I want to you know, take a moment to think about our current biome around the world as we're seeing this, you know, this reported pandemic occur, we, we can start to realize that, that what we're seeing across every country is a vulnerability of health. And if you look at Northern Italy or Germany, UK, Canada, and in these other countries that have had these dramatic, you know, you know, terrifying prevalence of, of deaths in the media, if you look at the population that actually died, the mean age in, in Northern Italy, for example, was 80 years of age. And so the vulnerability that led to the emergence of this pandemic in that population was extreme elder with two to three comorbidities, uh, some of them as high as five comorbid conditions, putting them at risk 
for the emergence of something like this, this expression of COVID and the morbidity that would come out of that and the mortality that would come out of that. In the United States, in contrast, we see much younger populations being affected. And so you, you, average age may be down in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, data is still out on that. But there's a sheer prevalence is telling. You know, if you look at the number of total global cases now, we're starting to report some 25% of all global cases of this coronavirus occurring in the United States, which is striking because we only have 4% of the global population, 300 million out of the 7 point, or, uh, you know, 8 billion. You've got 4% of the population that's expressing one out of four deaths uh, globally. It's starting to point to the fact that in the United States, we have the most compromised health on the planet. And this is daunting for us as, as kind of thinking of ourselves in this kind of manifest destiny of we are the most advanced you know, of economies, we're the most advanced technologically, we're the most innovative, blah, blah, blah. Find out that we've fallen this far behind the global curve of health is, is humbling on one side. But on the other side, it's really a harbinger of the collapse of, of the strength of the United States from a financial and economic powerhouse standpoint. Our economy is being challenged by a healthcare system that is now costing us close to $4 trillion a year. In our entire military budget, we spend $680 billion. So we need to be very aware that these curves of these chronic diseases are speaking to the vulnerability within us. As we start to think about the microbiome, I want to dive in for just a moment to remind you that the current science has taken us far beyond the concept of gut health. Uh, the gut was really our understanding of the micro ecosystem of the human body for the last couple of decades. But over the last five years, genomic studies in the breast, in, in the kidneys, in different organ systems throughout the body, we find out that there's a rich microbiome present in healthy tissues all of the time. And so it's not just the small bowel or in the colon and, and that GI tract and maybe your skin that's populated with the critical bacteria. It's the entire body. The entire body is this complex ecosystem of, of biodiversity from fungi to bacteria to the archaea and beyond. We have this organic garden within us. And each of those chronic diseases that have emerged are now being mapped back to a disruption of that microbiome organic garden environment to allow for the emergence of disease. So I want to dive in a little bit now in preparation for the understanding of how this garden is affecting the biology of human life. I want to dive into this, the topic of DNA. DNA has long been you know, understood to be the template of, of life. And how does a fetus form? Well, it's the DNA from mom and dad. That's been the long story that we've held. But as we start to untangle the genome of the human and start to understand its origins, we start to realize we are the amalgamation of the life within us and around us. We are not some sort of superior life form that is left to control that environment or to dominate and extract from that environment. We are literally the result of, we live within and because of this microbiome within us. The human DNA measures about one meter in every single cell, which is extraordinary. I spent a lot of time looking under microscopes throughout my career. And, and when you look through microscopes, you, you oftentimes lose perspective. You, they look huge under the microscope and you, th you see all these incredible, you know, almost city within itself there with all its compartments of function within a single human cell. And then you go to electron microscopy and you see even more extraordinary detail and complexity down at levels that really defy the human brain's capacity to understand how tiny this stuff is. But to understand that a tiny little human cell that measures, you know, less than, you know, a tenth the diameter of a human hair that tiny little cell is capable of packing in a meter of, of DNA, not just into the cell itself, but down into its tiny little nucleus that might be you know, less than 10% of its total volume. And so into this tiny, tiny little compartment, we pack in a meter of DNA. And we do that through a very specific methodology of packing. We wrap that DNA carefully around histones, which are these little balls that then allow us to pack the DNA super tight. And this starts to form chromosomes as we understand them. The interesting thing about that reality is none of that DNA can express itself into the RNA that would become an exosome kind of viral information stream or genomic you know, sequence that would then go on in the cytoplasm of the cell to make a protein. 
none of it can be transcribed unless it's unpacked specifically so it can be accessed. Imagine you know, having to go into your, uh, say, your filing cabinets to go and access that one file that has last year's taxes, and then you have to go find that one W-2 or whatever it is that you were looking for. You can't just walk up to the, to the filing cabinet and know the information. You have to go and unpack that information, find the specific data, pull that out, and then you can report that to your CPA or whatever it is. And so that in the same way, the DNA has to be accessed through an intelligent mechanism of data retrieval to even get the genomic template that you're looking for. And then you need to decide how you're going to express that information and who you're going to communicate that information to. So it's an extremely complex process to even access this extraordinary data that you have within each cell. The adult human body contains somewhere between 40 trillion and 70 trillion cells. And when you multiply that one meter out, it gets pretty exciting how much DNA you have inside of your, your body. Uh, if we were to take just one of you on the line here and string you end to end, you would wrap around the earth some 2 million times. And many of you have heard that statistic before, but it, I, I trust that no matter how many times you've heard me say that, that there's no way you can really wrap your head around how many times you wrap around that mother earth. Two million travels around the circumference of the earth is, is that DNA packed within your cells. The thing that gives me excitement is that we really don't understand the information contained within that because only 1% of that massive genomic data is actually programming for a gene. And so the human genome is actually super simple. With those 20,000 genes, we fall somewhere between a fruit fly and a flea. Fruit fly has about 13,000 genes. A flea has 30,000 genes. And so you fit right between the fruit fly and the flea in genetic complexity when it comes to the genes. But you have this other 99.8% of, of the genome that we call junk DNA that remains mysterious. What is the function of all of that DNA? And it used to be considered junk in, in the sense that maybe it was just left over from cellular data as we started to emerge from single cell life into multiple cellular life and into ultimately mammals and then humans. That whole four billion year journey was thought to just leave a lot, a lot of waste in its wake as we got more and more intelligent in our genomic sequences. But if, we, if it was really the genome that made us intelligent, you would think that we would have the 280,000 genes that we expected to have when we set out to decode the human genome. Find that we only have 20,000 suggests that our intelligence, our capacity for resilience and adaptation into every single ecosystem on the planet is not coming from our genes, but is hidden perhaps in this 99% of our genome that can wrap around Mother Earth you know, 2 million times. It's somewhere in that complexity of genetic information that we find the code of life and that we find the flexibility of our genome to express so many different versions of the human experience. So, uh, you know, comparing that human genome to the, to the macro ecosystem of the fruit fly and the flea is one thing, but as we start to look into the microbiome, we have to really start to, to humble ourselves further. When we, you look at the flea at 30,000 genes, it pales in comparison to the genomic information carried in the microbiome of your body. The bacteria alone, 40,000 species perhaps being the ideal number to be expressed in your gut, your skin, all your organ systems, they share some 2 million genes among that species variety. And so that compared to your 20,000, you're seeing this logarithmic jump in genomic possibility. And each of those genes is capable of making anywhere from 20 to 200 different proteins. And so you start to multiply 2 million times 200 and you start to realize the vast majority of proteins being in your, made in your body are being made by bacteria. And, and that's a, a humbling thing as, again, we start to realize this, this cataclysmic shift in understanding of human health, similar perhaps to Galileo with his telescope in the, in the 1600s, discovering that, oh my God, the earth is not at the center of the universe. We thought that the earth was still and the stars were revolving around us. We certainly felt like it was so. We didn't feel any motions here on the surface of the planet. To find out that we were swirling through space, circulating around our sun and our solar system, and our solar system was spinning within a, a large galaxy of a billion other suns that was then swirling in a universe of a billion other galaxies, this was a, this was a cataclysmic you know, paradigm shift, not just scientifically, but also challenged our religious beliefs, our religion, religious worldviews and, and kind of egocentrism that we had at the time. 
And so it took hundreds of years before people could really handle the, the, the reality of the fact that we were living within this solar system and, and galaxies and universes. In the same way, we are in, under the same now paradigm shift emerging just in the last decade that human health does not have the human cell at the center of it. Human health is derived as a human cell circulating, orbiting within the complex ecosystem of the bacteria, the fungi, and beyond. And for that, we become human. For that, we derive health. And so we have uh, this massive earth-shattering you know, paradigm shift in science happening. And it goes deeper than the bacteria. 300,000 species of parasites, they express some 2 billion genes in their species diversity. 3.5 million, some people thinking now maybe as high as 5 million species of fungi on the planet. They share already, and counting, still counting, but already some 125 trillion genes within that whole kingdom. And so you just can't really overestimate how microscopic the human experience is in the milieu of the global genome. We are nearly non-existent. All of this information, all of these trillions of genes from the fungi and the billions from the parasites and the millions from the bacteria have stemmed from one origin. So, so we see this massive diversity of genetic information stemming through a very simple original design. As cells started to develop on this planet, they had very few genes to work with. And we needed to develop, in order to create this type of biodiversity and resilience and a complexity of life on Earth, we had to develop an adaptive capacity, a capacity to adapt and change genetic information constantly. This is how life has emerged. And this is an exciting jump into, into that origin. Some three and a half billion years ago, we see the, the origins of cellular life within the fossil record. And these are the, called the Archaea or the old ones, which always gives me goosebumps when I, when I even say that. So the, the old ones, these, these ancient bacteria thrived in some of the most common extreme environments that you can think of, not just air, water, and sea, but also volcanoes and sulfur acid pools and, and the deep pressures of the oceans and ice fields, anything that you can imagine as kind of these extreme environments that would have defined the planet some three and a half billion years ago before we de developed the ecologic stability that would allow life to really you know, emerge as we see it today, we see these old ones appearing. And the old ones have very simple uh, structure. They're, they're very simple bacterioids, these prokaryotes. And they have an interesting capacity to move gene information. And so as we start to see life emerge, we immediately get to witness the beginnings of diversification through gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer was the original methodology. And horizontal gene transfer was really cool in that if there was a pool of acid or, or deep ocean or whatever was there that, that formed an archaea, if the archaea found the opportunity to adapt its genetic code by typically by misspelling, and so if there was an advantageous misspelling of the genome that allowed for a gain in function, that gene would then be transferred to all of the other bacteria or archaea within that pod. And so they do this through bumping into one another and transferring genetic information through little envelopes of, uh, of cell membrane that allow for this horizontal gene transfer to happen. Interestingly, if you speed forward a few billion years, this is exactly what happens in the field for a farmer when they continuously are spraying Roundup year after year and they end up a few years later with, this, with all types of species of weeds that are Roundup resistant. And so it's really striking, I think, that we can create this horizontal gene transfer in a field between weeds that are being pressured by a stressor of herbicide. One of them finds a, a leap out of, you know, an adaptation that allows them to survive the onslaught of this herbicide, and they can then pass that horizontally to other species. And they do that through this horizontal gene transfer. Same thing happens in an ICU when we're you know, constantly pressuring an environment of a human body or a, a whole environment of an operating room with a single antibiotic or multiple antibiotics. Sooner or later, one of those bacteria can, can create a genetic variation that allows for adaptation to, to occur. And when, when the adaptation jump occurs, we get to see this horizontal gene transfer become possible. And so all of the bacteria in your body can become resistant to that. So the, the strep or staph on your skin, for example, can become resistant to that antibiotic 
through this horizontal gene transfer. And so it's a really beautiful thing that we have examples today and three and a half billion years ago that the origins of life is really based in the, in the capacity for adaptation and regeneration. If it wasn't based in that, if, if we didn't have biology that was inherently adaptive and pushing for biodiversity all the time, there's no way life could have emerged in a planet that's in constant transformation. You go through ice ages, you go through you know, cataclysmic volcanic events that cover the earth in dust and choke out the topsoil and you get the, you know, the five great extinctions on the planet that have occurred and they are being adapted by and they've been escaped by this, this genetic code that has left behind all of that stress. And so when we see extinction level stressors happen on the planet, something interesting happens in the millions of years that follow. Instead of struggling back to some previous normal, we see this leap forward in genetic capacity for life to happen. And we see more intelligent and more bi biodiversity, more intelligence and biodiversity happen within the planet following those extinction events. And we can be confident that the reason for that is because of this capacity for adaptation of the genetic code under stress. The, the mechanisms by which we code the genome are actually uh, designed or have developed the ability to, to misspell under stress. And so as you increase the stress on an organism or on a genetic system, it will start to misspell itself quicker, looking for those gain of function and adaptations. If you multiply out how fast this is all happening, you look at like a pile of pig stool behind Smithfield, at, at, you know, pork processing plant, they have lakes of pig stool and they have you know, quadrillions and quadrillions of bacteria, fungi, all kinds of weird stuff growing in them. And the rate of, of gain of function that is being calculated is in the quadrillions or you know, 10 to the 30 or so. You know, so you've got this massive number of genetic variations being tried every second, every split second. Millions of organisms under that stress are creating new adaptation, trying to find the gain of function to survive in this new toxic environment that is not caused by volcanoes, sulfur acids, deep oceans, but by this time uh, caused by human behavior. And so humans have become the cataclysmic event on the planet this time to engineer the sixth extinction. So as we move into this you know, final you know, chapters of this extinction, where some halfway done already, we, we know we are putting massive pressure on the organisms of the planet to create adaptation to, pr to prepare for recovery in the future, whenever humans disappear, or at least our behavior changes to allow for recovery from this thing, it's exciting to imagine what could emerge, the biodiversity that could come out. One of the interesting cool things about this genetic uh, capacity within the Archaea three and a half billion years ago is that they have very similar mechanisms of genomic you know, translation into proteins as we do uh, in humans or in mammals. In contrast, the, the more typical bacteria that you think of, strep, staph, and things like this, uh, don't have the same uh, mechanisms of, of uh, genetic reproduction and, and translation into proteins that the archaea have. The bacteria are a little bit more recent. It was some you know, half a billion years of archaea before we start to see the emergence of, of more modern, if you will, bacterial variations. And these guys have a circular chromosome similar to the archaea, but with distinctly different machinery for that transcription and translation as mentioned. And so the cell division uh, became the primary mechanism of genetic transfer rather than horizontal gene transfer. As mentioned, in an ICU or otherwise, we can still see horizontal gene transfer happen, but it was through cell division and binary fission uh, that we started to see a primary mechanism of adaptation start to emerge in these bacteria. And so a slightly different method for genomic variety to, to be passed on to progeny. The horizontal gene transfer through a variety of means is, is now also understood to be common in these bacteria. So it's, it, it can happen through that direct contact. But somewhere around the same time of the bacteria, we developed the bacteriophage. And so the bacteriophage are the viruses that carry genetic information from one species to another or from one location of, within a species to another you know, geographic location. So the viruses emerge sometime back to allow for this horizontal gene transfer to actually cover distances. Up until this time, there, the mechanism of the archaea were limited to very small you know, contact regions. So it had to be in the same pool. It had to be, you know, they, they had to touch each other to get the, the gene transfer to happen. 
sometime around the emergence of bacteria, the archaea and the bacteriophage started to express viruses, where we start to get this long, long span, long distance genetic information transfer to happen. And that seemed to lay the foundation for the real diversification of the planet, but it would be another one and a half billion years. Again, that's a, you know, 1500 million years, you know, it's just so hard to wrap your mind around this timeline. But one and a half billion years ago, we see the emergence of the fungi. And these are the first multicellular organisms that are emerging from life. And the, the fungi uh, start to develop uh, this extraordinary uh, capacity for relationship uh, co-creation and that they could build complex giant structures by coordinating single cell behaviors with, with neighbors. So not, now they're not just passing information to and fro, they're starting to have this hyper-intelligence, this, this uh, kind of community level capacity for creative uh, formation, and they would create things like the mycelium, the incredible network of, of root system that we think of for the, for the fungi that can cover many square miles. They developed uh, the microscopic uh, structures of the hyphae and pseudohyphae that are pictured here on this slide, where you see differentiation happening at different parts of the structure. And that differentiation is starting to point to that first multicellular organism capacity where you have cells that subspecialize within a species to do some specific task within it. And it's interesting to, to consider one aspect of bacteria versus fungi forming, which is bacteria uh, developed a higher level of, of energy production than the archaea. The archaea had to do a very slow fermentation process to create energy for themselves to have any metabolic function to be able to reproduce or whatnot. The more modern bacteria developed a capacity for uh, methane breakdown and, and methane fermentation and, and you know, a, a more advanced, uh, more efficient mechanism of creating energy, which allowed them to diversify faster uh, create more you know, uh, resilient niches within the ecosystem because they could create more energy. The fungi as kind of a next leap forward is really interesting to me because here the, the fungi didn't just figure out how to adapt to multicellular cooperation in, in and of themselves within their own species. They figured out how to multipurpose the entire planet for their own good. And they did this through digestion. And so instead of like the bacteria figuring out how to bring nutrients into the cell and turn them into fuel, the fungi had an incredible innovation where they decided that they would uh, be able to go ahead and move uh, energy from the environment directly into them. And so what they do is they exude digestive enzymes and their digestive material uh, or digestive mechanisms out into the environment around them, functionally turning the entire soil system, if you will, into a stomach and then absorbing those nutrients passively so that they outsource the need for a stomach, they outsource the need for uh, fuel production to, to the greater environment around them. So I'm, I'm fascinated by that because it helps me reorient myself when I walk through a garden or a soil system to remember the rest of us might just be the stomach for the fungi. And the rest of us might just be a feeding system for this hyper intelligence that lives within the soil systems. And, and it's a really cool concept that the fungi really outsourced all of nature uh, or, outsourced, or outsourced its energy system to all of nature. And so it may be the most resilient and, and you know, powerful structure on the planet today is these incredible fungi and their capacity to create energy around them. You mentioned the mycelium already, uh, the GI tract of the globe there. But there's this one other structure that I do want to mention because it just uh, is pointing to this co-creative uh, universe that started to, to emerge with the, the origin of the fungi. The mycorrhizae are this extremely complex system of structures within the soil that occur between the mycelium, the, the soil network or root system of the fungi, and a plant. And so if you, you finally get a multicellular plant to grow in soil, we find that it can't actually do even its original you know, nutrient absorption without the presence of the mycorrhizae. And so the bizarre thing about that is neither the fungi or the plant have any genetic code or understanding on how to make this mycorrhizae in and of themselves. It's not until you see these two species together, you see a multicellular plant, uh, imagine maybe one of those early ferns or whatnot, and that original you know, mycelium within the soil systems and that archaic structure of soil, and they suddenly co-created something, the mycorrhizae, to uh, enable 
uh, nutrients into the fungi. This is very much a chicken and the egg thing for me. I can imagine the first plant life, whether they be mosses or they be uh, some sort of fern or whatnot, struggling along where they can, they're hard, they've made a leap genetically to be able to start to build multicellular, more specialized structures than the fungi. They're starting to be able to do photosynthesis for the, the development of, of the, the plastids, which are like the early mitochondria. But they haven't yet, you know, really found thrive until they cooperate with the mycelium of those soils to create mycorrhizae, and suddenly they are able to, you know, logarithmically increase their nutrient and water absorption from soil systems, and they, then they explode. Then they take over the world, and so then you see the emergence of the primordial jungles and forests and rainforests of the world as the relationship between plant and mycelium of the fungi become at their highest level of function through this co-creative uh, hair-like structure of the mycorrhizae that uh, surrounds the plant. Also uh, contingent with this time frame, we see the, the origins of yeasts and molds start to really be able to accelerate the, the journey of, of uh, these organisms through complex ecosystems. So yeasts and molds, can take on different forms to survive different stressors to be able to survive those stressors and proliferate on the backside of those, so the adaptation phase. And then the spores within the fungal kingdom became the long distance travelers. And so while we have the, the bacteriophage, the viruses emerging long before the fungi, we see the bacteriophage starting to move through viral mechanisms, genetic information for the bacteria the fungi figured out how to do this through spores. And so we have this, you know, this protein structure that uh, envelopes the genetic information that can you know, bind to pollen and dust and travel for you know, hundreds or thousands of miles through these spore structures through all kinds of adverse seasons and everything else, and then uh, set up shop and, and build a new center for life with uh, that, that fungi starting to get a new niche within a new ecosystem through that spore delivery. And so you've got the bacteriophage translating through viruses and you've got the, the fungi translating through spores to get this genetic information dispersed across the globe to create the world that we know today. As we start to you know, think a little bit deeper, I just throw this thing in out of just curiosity in some ways, but the cellular structure of the cell wall that was developed by the fungi was very unique at the time. It was not seen previous to, to the fungi developing this, this protein called chitin. Uh, that creates the rigid cell walls that make their structures ca capable of forming, uh, and especially these you know, complex hyphae and pseudo hyphae that are pictured here. But it's interesting to see that the chitin becomes the shell of the arthropods, the insects. And, and it's not hard to imagine then, you know, the idea of these, these fungi taking on diverse structures and developing more and more specialization within those start to adapt a different form of life. And so it's really intriguing to me that the stage was set for a genetic paradigm leap towards an insect from these, these chitin forming um, fungi of the soils. And it's also interesting that they are leaps. The, these adaptation events that happen are not like, uh, you know, the, the famous, you know, uh, work done in the, in the Galapagos Islands by, you know, Darwin and all of his co colleagues saying that there was a slow progression of, of development and evolution and, and you know the fossil record would bear out that there was this evolutionary thing where one species turned into another species turned into another. That didn't end up bearing out. The fossil record has never shown us the leap from one species to the next. It looks to be this, these paradigm shifts suddenly happen. The stage is suddenly set such that a horse can emerge from the genetic information there, or a pig can emerge, or a human can emerge. And for all of these mammals that develop, we can't find the genetic link on we can't, as to kind of what the steps were, and we can't find in the fossil record the transition from one mammal to the next. And so what seems to happen instead is you suddenly get a, some sort of rearrangement, some gain of function event, where you suddenly get a rearrangement of life, and it, it, it happens overnight nearly, you know, completely differently than it's ever happened before. That's what the fossil record suggests. And the viruses are starting to give us an insight into how that's possible. How can you have a sudden rearrangement of biology such that something new is, is, is capable of emerging? And it's through this incredible adaptive capacity of the genetic variations, the genetic information transferring between species that allow this to happen. 
protozoa. These are you know, starting to move in from bacteria and fungi into the, the first you know, subspecialization within a single cell. And so within the protozoa, you start to see the nuclei and the, the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus and all these complex you know, uh, mechanisms or systems within the cell to allow ultimately better, better uh, fuel management, better production of energy so that more life and life abundant can be expressed by that organism. These single, single cell organisms were the first eukaryotes to inhabit all of the ecosystems of the planet. They're much larger than the bacteria, and they have specifically these organelles like a nucleus to contain the nuclear DNA, which allowed us to package them uh, genetic information differently. It allowed us to store a deep data bank or deep memory of DNA, much different than the bacteria that have short memories of their genetic code. The way in which we pack into a, a more complex structure of the you know, moving from the ringed uh, DNA of bacteria to the double helix, what we have is a better and better hard drive of genetic information. We have a better memory bank of genetic information that's stored in a safer fashion, uh, in a more secure fashion than kind of the short-term RAM uh, type memory that a bacteria has with its little circular DNA. Interestingly, the other leap forward that happened with, with the protozoa was the advent of the mitochondria. And so these little mitochondrion-like organelles that we see in protozoa was the, the emergence of a couple of uh, these, or, or the emergence of a couple of bacteria. And so the first mitochondria looks to have been the combination of an archaea that consumed a methane producing bacteria that was smaller than itself. And so a large archaea consumes a, a methane producing bacteria and you end up with a totally new mechanism of producing energy. And that totally new mechanism in the case of the human is the ability to turn sugar and fat into uh, an ATP molecule through respiratory uh, process, through an oxygen-dependent pathway, we can do non-fermentation producing energy. And so oxidation is much more functional than fermentation in production of energy. And so it's another 100-fold leap in energy potential in the cell as you put a mitochondria within this system and kind of you know, it, you know, outsource energy production uh, at the bacteria level to a special, specialized mitochondrion within yourself, you have this big leap in, in potential. And these cells can be loaded. The average human cell has 200 mitochondrion within them, these little bacterioid guys that are producing energy for every one of our cells all the time. And so we talk about that huge bacterial fungi you know, uh, diversity outside of our bodies, it pales in comparison to the number of mitochondria we have within us. And so the numbers are pretty startling. If you look at the bacteria, for example, there's some estimates of around 1.4 quadrillion bacteria in and around a human body. That pales by 10x to the 14 quadrillion mitochondria that live inside of ourselves in the healthy state. And for both the bacteria and the mitochondria, they respond in the same way to herbicides. And so as we start to pound herbicides and pesticides, these antibiotics into our food system, we kill the potential of the bacteria outside of our cells and the mitochondria within our cells, and we start to age more rapidly. And then we see the emergence of the biologic collapse as we po poison this incredible microecosystem within us. The protozoa are famous for malaria, and I bring that up because there's been so much attention right now to hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment for COVID. And this was laughed at by scientists initially because you know, the anti-malarial has nothing to do with a virus in the, in the traditional context of, of, of uh, an antibiotic kind of mindset. Uh, uh, but when you start to look at the deeper story of genomics and everything else, and you start to imagine what could happen if we start screwing with the genomic information of the protozoa with our body, with a drug that's, you know, whether it's effective or not, it looks like it's probably got some effect in some individuals early on in the course of this disease because it changes the shape of the red blood cell through modification of protein structure. But my concern is if we start willy-nilly throwing people onto something like hydroxychloroquine, we're going to start to undermine the protozoal foundation of life within us. Just as if we start putting everybody on prophylactic antibiotics, we end up with more antibiotic resistance and we end up with more autoimmune disease. We end up with all more major depression. And so we know that we, we exacerbate human disease when we undermine uh, the microbiome within us. And it, it startles me that we're throwing people on high doses of prednisone and hydroxychloroquine, not really understanding the consequences six months, 12 months, you know, two years down the road of wiping out the protozoa. We've, we think of the protozoa like malaria being bad for us. We have this kind of parasite mentality and we're afraid of them, 
but all the new science emerging is obviously like the bacteria and fungi showing us that we can't live without the protozoa. If we don't have abundant protozoa within our stool, we have a dysfunctional microbiome and we can't do our, our good work. All right. So the power plant of the cell, uh, I talked about with the plastids and the mitochondria within the cell, these really emerged to allow for the protozoa to emerge and they become critical to, to complex plant life and human life ultimately, you know, the mammals and the rest. And they have their own genome and it, it's important to realize that these guys are uh, you know, related to the archaea because they have the capacity for this extremely fast uh, horizontal gene transfer. And so with a striking thing that is now emerging is that these circular chromosomes within the mitochondria are now comp capable of moving ho through horizontal gene transfer their mitochondrial DNA into the nuclear DNA of the human and in fact vice versa. We now understand that uh, re there's remarkable variations of mitochondrial DNA that occur in a single cell. If you look at a single liver or neural cell that contains over 2,000 mitochondria, as you look into that, that population, you can see the daughter cells within that, you know, as one of those cells creates another neuron or another liver cell, there's huge variety even in the progeny of the mitochondrial DNA as well. So there's mitochondrial diversity within a single cell and those that go on to create the next cell will have even more diversity. And in recent work looking at uh, the ability for uh, cloning of, of humans or otherwise, we're starting to realize that no mammal can be cloned unless not you clone the mitochondrial DNA within those cells, not just the, the parental kind of human uh, nuclear DNA as we had previously thought. If you don't copy the mitochondrial DNA, then you get a similar effect. You, you might look like your twin, but different genomics ultimately. And, and so to get an absolute you know, copy of it, you would ha have to clone every single mitochondria within the cell along with that nuclear DNA to achieve the results. One interesting thing that is now starting to find out is mitochondria have exported through gene transfer many of their critical functions that are coded by their DNA into the nuclear DNA of the human cell for long-term storage so that it's not misspelled. So some of the critical proteins, enzymes, et cetera, necessary for mitochondria to do their work the genes that code for that have been transferred out of the mitochondria into the human DNA and have to be accessed from the human DNA to make those critical proteins that are needed every second of their function. And so I hope you're starting to realize that you know, in this talk, not only is there some massive genetic information transfer between species out in the environment, within a single cell, there's constant, you know, every millionth of a second, information flowing back and forth between the genome of a mitochondria that's trying to produce energy from your recent meal to the nuclear DNA of the human. And so we have this massive sea of constant two-way communication going on genetically all over the planet. And this is happening at all different levels. Our virus is part of the microbiome and when did they show up? The microbiome, organisms that live in and on the human body, it turns out uh, have, have been continuously clumped into this, this category. The viruses don't fit here though. And I, I clump myself in, in, in being culpable for too often referring to the viruses as part of the microbiome in the past. I'm trying to really create my, you know, change my own lexicon and create a different method of communicating this because it leads to misperceptions. I, didn't, I hadn't thought through what would be the consequences of people thinking that the viruses were part of the microbiome until this pandemic. Now I'm watching governments and, and you know, regulatory bodies spraying their, their atmosphere with you know, herbicides and all kinds of antibiotic toxins trying to kill and sterilize organisms in their environment because they're trying to attack some virus. And so over the last few months, I've had this kind of overwhelming, humble realization. Not, I've been miscommunicating this by thinking that these were pathogens that could leap out and attack us. We're, we're treating them as if they're bacteria. We're treating them. So it's important that we all come to a realization that viruses are not at all microbes. They are actually just a genetic transfer mechanism for this information to travel. And so I think you've already extracted that from the talk so far, but I really want to hammer this home. You can't go and kill something that's not alive, right? And so the viruses are not alive. Therefore, they don't fit the definition of biome, which means living organism. And so when you, and if you read why viruses are clipped, clumped in, it says because they're so small. 
microbiome describes small things, living organisms, but viruses are much smaller than the typical bacteria, and so they're so small, small, that we call them microbiome. Well, that doesn't fit. That, that doesn't work for me at all. Just because they fit the first half of the word and don't fit the second half, just because they're extra good at the first half doesn't make them ever fit into the second half of the word. And so the microbiome in my book is archaea, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, you know, these single cell and multicellular organisms and cooperative environments that define the ecosystem of life around us, the viruses are simply the communication network between them. We know that they do not produce their own fuel. We know that they have no met metabolism for producing energy. We know they cannot reproduce in, in their own structures. And so uh, they just are this simple genetic package of information that became necessary for life to emerge from the planet. This is how life has adapted. It's how biodiversity has emerged is through a communication network that is allowed to travel the world over. Viruses have been traveling the world over long before the first airplane. I want you to hold on to that fact. When the CDC shows you a map of like, oh, the virus traveled around because this person flew from Hubei to Italy or this person from there to there, that, that is a completely erroneous picture of how viruses travel. Viruses were not dependent on humans, let alone human air travel, to start to be able to cover the planet. Viruses have done this for eons, for billions of years. The genetic code has blanketed the planet to create biodiversity and adaptation throughout every niche of the ecosystem. All right, let's dive in for a moment into the, the source of human DNA. We, we focused in on what is that genome look like with the 20,000 genes and all of that that junk DNA sitting there without, you know, that's passed on so carefully from generation to generation, we're starting to decode the, the, the RNA that comes out of the junk DNA. But I wanna, before going into the junk DNA in future lectures, I wanna go into the, those 20,000 genes, those 20,000 critical genes that define mammals. And, it's, and when I say human DNA here, we're really talking about mammalian DNA because it's all pretty much identical. In fact, a pig and a human are absolutely identical in the genetic information held within them. It's just reorganized in a different fashion. So if you clip the human DNA, those 20,000 genes, if you clip them into 178 pieces and rearrange the puzzle, you can spell pig from start to finish without a single base pair in the wrong spot. And so it is a puzzle piece reorganization that allows humans, not pigs, to emerge from, from a womb. And so this is starting to get at how does massive paradigm leaps from you know, one organism to a completely new species within mammals happen? How, do, how does Homo sapiens emerge? There's a puzzle piece rearrangement that happened. And that puzzle piece rearrangement happens through the mechanisms often of viruses. So viruses give us the adaptation capacity to rearrange genomes. And it's exciting to imagine that this is how we were put together. But I also want to zoom in here, not just on the pieces, but actual the, the, the real origin of our genome. So those 20,000 human genes that we think were inherited from mom and dad were ultimately uh, inherited from the viruses themselves. And so the viruses, through their genetic you know, data bank from all the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, and the rest that we've described, created a bank of information genetically. And they started to be organized in different fashions to allow for mammals to occur. The human genome with our 20,000 genes, or the pig with its 20,000 genes, we now understand more than 50% of those were direct results of a genomic insertion. So these weren't adaptations that happened within the human cell or within the mammal. This was an adaptation that happened outside of the mammalian history. Predating the mammals, these genetic information streams were coming, and more than 50% didn't need any modification once you know, inserted into mammalian species. Once inserted into there, they were durable information pieces that, that existed. Again, let me, I want to say this again because I think it's so overwhelmingly cool. 50% of the genes within your 20,000 were inserted directly and preserved by and through the viruses. And so you have preserved genetic information received by the viruses to become who you are today. At least 8% of those genes were inherited by RNA retroviruses like HIV. And so I want you to start to wrap your head around the fact that a viral information stream is nothing but a software update to the human. Our genetic code was literally built by these things. And if we decide that we are in opposition to genetic information, if we are in opposition to the viruses themselves and we are out to kill them, 
we are bound to go extinct because we are going to lose the adaptive capacity of being human. And we see this very specifically in the treatment of retroviruses. And so one, some of my early research was in, in the endocrine world was looking at protease inhibitors, which are uh, the cornerstone of antiretroviral therapy. And that antiretroviral therapy uh, was um, amazingly getting a, a, a battery warning here. So I better before I lose this whole seminar, realize that I didn't plug in my computer. One of those minor details in life. So I need a genomic update here and I'm going to go grab my charger and I'll be right back. I'm back proving that I'm only human and not as intelligent as the fungi yet. I don't know how to do complete systems management on my own. Back here, thinking about the retroviruses and the protease inhibitors. So the protease inhibitors are a drug that we put uh, HIV patients on to block the ability of retroviruses to communicate back and forth to the genome. And it's very effective at, at blocking the replication of the HIV virus. It, it became a paradigm shifting you know, uh, drug treatment for this. But my area of, of focus was on the repercussions to the endocrine system and specifically to digestive mechanisms and pancreatitis that was emerging as a common complication of these protease inhibitors. And so as I now you know, look back on that research you know, 15, 20 years ago, I realized I didn't even realize what I was missing. I was missing the big picture that when we put somebody on a protease inhibitor and we start to block the ability of retroviral communication across a genome, we're probably blocking thousands of gene transfer products at any given moment that are trying to do this communication between retroviruses and the human genome, mitochondrial uh, uh, genomics, and their, their nuclear DNA that transfer mechanisms. So as we start to disrupt movement of RNA back and forth across the, the gene transfer system, we start to get huge complications. And, and the most common complications are visceral adiposity, fat gathering around the abdomen, insulin resistance and diabetes and pancreatitis. And so we are doing through protease inhibitors exactly what we're seeing in, in the larger population. We see diabetes going up, insulin resistance, visceral fat uh, accumulation, which lowers testosterone and screws up estrogen mechanisms, all of this. And so it's interesting that we're seeing an antiretroviral kind of effect to the herbicide pesticides that we're using in our food systems and beyond. And so our overall steeped drug environment, this antibiotic, antiviral type environment and attitude that we've adopted is undermining the very physiology of energy production within the cell. When you lose energy production in the human, we start to accumulate fat. When you can't turn that fat into energy, you store the fat. And so when we start to see visceral adiposity, we know we've disrupted mitochondrial metabolism. We've disrupted the functioning of energy production. And so we are having a population level failure of energy production as we undermine these fundamentals of genomic information transfer to and from. And so it's a daunting thing how far we've missed. Next few slides are gonna emphasize just how important these viral inserts were uh, into our genome. Uh, one of the most important ones is this ERI15 uh, insertion. This was a retrovirus like HIV that inserted itself in the human uh, or in mammalian genome millions of years back before humans emerged. And it, it allows for a very special um, mechanism of killing the mitochondria within the tail of the sperm to allow for only nuclear DNA from the, from the male to enter the female ovum. Because I mentioned to you that the mitochondria can swap information between the nucleus and itself, and there's lots of variations of that. For the first mammals to emerge, there was some sort of hyperintelligence present that it would only work if, this, if the, the mitochondria were deleted from the sperm before fertilization occurs. And so before we could really have the first functional you know, gene transfer mechanism where the female would hold all the information of diversity and adaptation of the mitochondria. I hope you heard that sentence, it's pretty fascinating. The female egg holds all of the potential for diversification, adaptation through the communication of mitochondria and the nuclear DNA before fertilization. And at fertilization, only nuclear DNA from dad enters so that it's only mom's adaptation capacity that is remembered or carried forward by that, that progeny. 
And so we have this hyperintelligence of the sperm that can dump its own mitochondria before entering it. And it couldn't have happened without this ERI15 gene that allows for that, which was inserted by a retrovirus. Okay, I hope you're understanding how important that, that viral update was. Another critical viral update, retrovirus again, um, allows for the uh, human placenta to form. And so whether it's the initial fertilization or ultimately the implantation in, in, of, of, of a uh, ovum or a fertilized egg on the wall of the uterus that would then go on to build itself a placenta, you can't go on to build that without yet another retrovirus update. And that was this hemoprotein. And so very interesting to imagine just these couple of examples within the 10,000, I'm giving you just a few, but there's a couple of examples here that you can't you realize we could have not have had the initial mammalian life without retroviral insertion, without viral updates to our software to allow us to adapt life differently. One of my favorite examples of this is stem cells. So RNA virus, very similar actually to coronavirus, um, developed the HERV-H sequence, which makes it possible uh, for pluripotent stem cells to function. And the HERV-H sequence is expressed at very high amounts. Remember, there's thousands and thousands of genes present in one of these pluripotent stem cells, but a full 2% of them is this one HERV-H uh, uh, compound. And that sequence makes it possible for a pluripotent stem cell to create different tissues from the same cell. And so typically, if you see like a liver cell, for example, a liver cell can only make a liver cell. A liver cell has no mechanism of going and creating a kidney or a brain neuron. However, it does contain all of that genetic information. Now, all the genetic information in a liver cell is contained within the nucleus. Somehow, a liver cell is confined to that bumper blocks of I am a liver cell, so I only make this set of genes to pre present myself as a liver cell. Well, it turns out that there's bumper blocks that, that occur to keep a single organ system within its own defined mechanism. When that human organism starts to, or, or when that uh, pluripotent stem cell wants to shift, it accesses HERV-H to shift across the bumper leg block. So HERV-H allows for the genetic transcription and translation to, to move beyond the typical bumper blocks to express any cell that is needed. And so we could not have had that level of adaptation and regeneration within the human body. That first stem cell, how important was that to the leap forward of biology on the planet? Could not have happened without an RNA virus so similar to corona. And so I, I'm really laying this out for you and I could go on for you know 10,000 others. And I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Pete, Pete Cummings to you at the end of this uh, presentation. And, and Pete's going to come back with another extraordinary example of this in the months to come as, as we start to tell you stories about how the current understanding of memory. And, and Peter's a, a neuropathologist, triple board certified, amazing physician, but he's, he's going to blow your mind over what your mind does to create memory. And again, it's going to base itself around the mechanisms by which we transfer RNA and these RNA type viral capsids across genetic information. And so it's very exciting to realize not only could we not have emerged, we would have no memory perhaps without this genetic intelligence within us that was adapted through and injected into us, updated literally by the viruses. So to further decrease our fear factor of viruses, if you haven't stopped fearing them and realizing that they're actually the source of life and so there's no reason to demonify these things, we want to take a look at just how abundant they are. And so one liter of seawater, imagine just that like Dasani bottle floating out there in the ocean right now, plastic waste. If you allow that to fill with ocean water, inside that one liter is a 10 to the 10 viruses. And so you've got you know, somewhere around 10 billion viruses in that one liter. In the whole ocean, you now have to add 30 zeros on the end of that one. So it's 1.2 times 10 to the 30 viruses contained within the ocean. In one gram of soil, we see 10 to the nine viruses, similar to the whole liter of, of ocean water. Soil worldwide at 2.5 times 10 to the 31, so similar to the, the volume of viruses within the ocean water. 10 to the 15 viruses in a typical adult human body. Can you please take that information in? 10 to the 15, you're up in the trillions of viruses in a human body right now. And so you have been taught to fear a single virus right now in the context of 10 to the 15 trillions of viruses present in your body right now, and your body's in complete homeostasis, complete balance with that virome. 
to show you just how fast we are exposed to this viromics in neonatal babies, we can look at seven days to find 10 to the eight viruses per gram of feces. By the end of the first week, 10 to the eight viruses present in, in, the, in the bowel of that baby interacting with that whole human system. It's interacting with the respiratory tree, it's interacting with the bowels, it's reacting all over the place. And yet that baby is not febrile, it's not sick, it's in total balance with 10 to the eight viruses per gram. You multiply that out and you're, you're many times that, but 10 to the eight gram per gram is in total balance with the human system. And yet that baby doesn't have the ability to make a, an antibody yet. Please listen to that. Without any antibody production capacity, that baby is in perfect balance in this, uh, you know, homogeneous kind of uh, uh, word's not going to help you out. It, it's in this this utter state of balance genetically and and microbially with that virome at seven days of of life. And what this is speaking to is that we do not interact with the virome through our adaptive immune system, which is the one that makes antibodies. We interact with it through the, in, the innate immune system, which is one that primarily functions on healthy boundaries between the gut and the bloodstream, for example, and healthy boundaries at the genetic level between outside information and inside information. And we do this through mutagen proteins and all of this to make sure that the information flowing into a cell can be chewed up. If it's not desirable, if it's just violent content that's threatening to the organism, we have all kinds of mechanisms to break those genetic uh, sequences up before they ever go on to replicate. We have all kinds of mechanisms within the cell to stay balanced with 10 to the 8 viruses per gram of stool long before that child at maybe six months of age has the ability to, to produce its full host of antibodies. So keep in mind that when somebody says we're developing a vaccine to treat or prevent a virus, it's impossible that that is the right biology. It is, doesn't fit any of it. If you've gone, for example, to get your antibodies checked, many of us have gone to, to get our IgG and IgM antibodies to COVID checked to see if we've been exposed before because 50% of people who get it are asymptomatic. And so I traveled a whole bunch around the world in the, in the early days of COVID and I was convinced that I must have had it. And so I went and, and uh, checked uh, my antibodies. When you go to get your antibodies checked, they very appropriately tell you that if you have been exposed to this virus in the last five to six weeks, this test is inaccurate. It's only accurate after five to six weeks post-exposure, which is ridiculous to think that that's helpful to clearing the virus. Those antibodies were clearing the virus because the virus actually disappeared three to five days after it started to proliferate within your system. It's the innate immune system that makes the virus go away and find the balance within the organism. And it's not killing the, the, the virus. It's not killing anything. There's nothing alive there. It's simply coming into a genetic balance and not replicating that virus anymore after three to five days of work. It finds its balance point and, and diminishes its reproduction of that virus. And then it's another five to six weeks before there's an antibody load that would be you know, available to, to change our relationship to the biome outside. And so I want you to hold on to the information that an antibody is a very late breaking news and is not a primary mechanism for balance with the virome. It's a, a late breaking systemic reaction to a post viral syndrome. It doesn't have to do, it isn't your first rate of defense. That's why the flu vaccine has never worked to prevent cases. The only thing they try to show with flu vaccine is that maybe it decreases the, the amount of time that you're symptomatic. It doesn't decrease the amount of mortality across the population, doesn't decrease the number of flus happening. It simply decreases the length of time that some populations have after exposure. And typically that population is males, 45 to 55, seem to have you know, six hours less of symptoms if they had the flu vaccine and then get exposed to and express the influenza virus. And so that, that's all we've been able to manage with, you know, billions of people vaccinated over time with the flu vaccine. And so you cannot prevent a pandemic, nor can you change the trajectory with a pandemic with a, an antibody response or an adaptive immune system response induced by a, a, a vaccine. And so this whole story that everybody's arguing about, are we pro-vaccines, anti-vaccines, that whole story and that whole argument is actually antiquated. We now know that it has nothing to do with the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is a late breaking and not very critical piece of how we stay in balance with 10 to the eighth viruses per gram of feces or 10 to the 15 viruses in my total human body right now. 
So we need to really change our perspective that we are a continuum with this and we have viruses within us all the time. This incredible study looked at over 8,000 people, 8,200 people, and they were looking, uh, looked for 120 different viruses. They found 94 of the 120 in this uh, constituent of 8,000 people. Uh, and they were expressed in 42% of the study participants. The sequences included DNA viruses, proviruses, and RNA viruses. And uh, they included the following list. And when you take a look at the prevalence, it's stunning. And the most amazing statistic to me is the prevalence of HIV in this population that was living in the United States and in Western Europe. And so this is where we should have the lowest rates of HIV in the world are in those two countries. 95% or more of all of HIV in the world is thought to occur in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. And so what, what we have here is, is what should be the least you know, prevalent you know, HIV in the entire population of the world. We find it in 0.06% of the population. Hep C and influenza come in at 0.01%. And so you know, five, six times more HIV than our hep C and influenza in this population of 8,200 healthy people. That's astounding. What it means is we have fundamentally misunderstood our relationship to HIV, perhaps the most feared virus globally as far as its prevalence and, and the impact it's had on the globe, the amount of billions of dollars we've spent, to find out that all these asymptomatic people are walking around in total balance with this HIV virus is astounding. And again, pointing to the fact that we have the wrong overall paradigm, not just against COVID and, and our misperceptions there. We have a misunderstanding of our entire relationship to this genomic milieu of the virome. I won't go into too much more detail. This just goes into detail on, on how far we're missing our, our actual estimates. If, if this study of 8,200 people is even remotely close to accurate, we have you know, radically misunderstood uh, the prevalence of this, this virus and our relationship to it. Um, this is just looking at the fact that you know, Central Europe up at the top is just a little fraction. Uh, you get uh, North America in there as well. But uh, as you start to look through it, you start to realize that you know, a fraction of the total HIV burden uh, is presented outside of Africa currently in our public health statistics, and we need to rewrite that book. We need to come to terms with the fact that the prevalence is probably much more similar across all of the countries of the world, and we need to stop you know, harping on sub-Saharan Africa as the epicenter. We need to instead ask, what is wrong with the sub-Saharan environment that's creating such an abnormal relationship to this virus? What is the terrain of the, of the starvation and poor nutrition and everything else that's leading to this abnormal relationship where the HIV is no longer asymptomatic and balanced, but is presenting itself as one of the many uh, you know, viruses, including all of the herpes viruses that have to be present to create something like AIDS. And so the AIDS epidemic that we see in Sub-Saharan Africa looks to be really pointing to the reality that we have a change in terrain in this vulnerable population where we have chronic undernourished sta status, we have poor water hygiene, poor access to all kinds of, of basic nutrient delivery systems, uh, poor you know, collapse of farming now, collapse of soil systems, it goes on and on. We have a dying planet within Africa and the expression of viruses are just the consequence of a failure of the balancing system, the innate immunity that keeps us in balance with that virome. All right, I don't need to harp on that too much longer. Prevalence of hep C in the United States, I do wanna to point to this graph because it, it, it correlates again with our quote unquote discovery of HIV. I guess in that context, that last slide's kind of important. We now know, looking back as far as we can, we've only been able to look back in the 1950s with our blood banks, but we have found that HIV has been, been detectable all the way back to the 1950s and it didn't emerge as a syndrome until the early 80s, you'll recall. And so we changed our relationship fundamentally with HIV and sometime in the late 1970s to allow for the emergence of, of AIDS by the early 80s. And interestingly, if we start to think about it as a change in relationship instead of the emergence of a new virus, we start to look at other viruses and ask the same question. Did we have a fundamental change in relationship in the late 70s? And here I would point to the graphs of hepatitis C and say, absolutely. We had almost no hepatitis C reported in the United States or otherwise through the 1950s and 60s, early 70s. Suddenly by the late 70s, starting to uptick. By the time you hit 1992, which is when we're starting to really fundamentally change our relationship to herbicides and pesticides in our farming system, we're seeing this you know, near logarithmic, you know, vertical hockey stick kind of prevalence of hepatitis C in the, in, in the human bloodstream. 
And so we fundamentally changed the terrain by which these viruses stay in balance with us. And when we lost the terrain, we lost our balance, then the viruses start to over, be overexpressed. We lose, our, lose that, that balanced state. We come into a state of imbalance, not because the immune system necessarily failed, but because our innate adaptation to this genetic information became abnormal and we couldn't access information correctly or we were accessing the wrong information consistently to express these genetic uh, events that we would call a viral illness. How does the cell protect against viral genomes? Um, I've talked about the innate immune system and this is just getting into a little more detail for all of you who are physicians and scientists. I wanted to put in a little detail here so that you've got a rabbit hole to jump down if you want. Uh, the apobec proteins are some of the most interesting ones out there. These have been studied extensively in, in HIV viral latency and those individuals that have HIV in their bloodstream but don't present with any downstream consequences to that at the immune system level or at the white cell uh, count, et cetera. The APOBAC 3A and 3G enzymes seem to be very critical into this, uh, this uh, balance with uh, the genetic information flowing into the cell from the virome. Um, this is important, a second step, you know, you have protection from the apoback proteins that are there to kind of bring you into balance with genetic information flowing in. But once you preserve some of that information, the apoback proteins decide not to degrade some genetic information coming in from the virome. There's lots of other steps involved. It's now considered the most complicated, most highly regulated step in human biology is RNA ribosomal biology. And so the ribosome is the, the, the big enzyme that turns RNA genetic information into proteins. So the only way that a virus can proliferate its information is through this ribosomal information. And we now know that this is one of the most highly regulated, carefully controlled mechanisms, which again protects us from overproduction of viral information, but also protects us from inappropriate expression of our own gene genes. And so to do this, there's more than 79 ribosomal proteins that are now needing to be pre understood to be needed to be present around that ribosome before it can function. And there's other, another 200 proteins like helicases and the rest that have to be uh, re reduced to allow for the RNA to occur. So we have co-activators and co-suppressors around the ribosomal RNA mechanism to create that first proliferation of a viral information stream or a genetic information, information stream coming out of our nucleus. And so it's, I want to show you this level of complexity to reassure you that there is no such thing as a virus that can leap in and attack a healthy human body and take over its machinery. The only way in which we come into an abnormal relationship with a virus is if we've had massive breakdown of signaling and communication and balance mechanisms within the cell. And so when we say somebody is dying from a viral syndrome, what we're really saying is this person is dying because they've had a fundamental destruction of thousands of, of pathways within the human body that should have kept them in balance with the ecosystem around them and the virome of communication that's coming into their bodies. So as we start to think of that human body as this extraordinary, beautiful balance of organic garden communicating through this viromic you know, milieu of information, I want us to take a look at our current response to COVID. Uh, these are images from the last few months of us spraying these toxins that damage DNA. Since they're not living organisms, we have to spray toxins that will are carcinogens. A carcinogen is something that accelerates genetic injury. So we're spraying carcinogens into our atmospheres up and down streetways and through park systems and right on to people coming off their airplanes. We've repurposed farm equipment, fire equipment. We've actually in Switzerland, they've repurposed snow, snow making machines to spray billions of gallons of these things in the air. It's truly astounding that we have, in the, the advent of a yet another pandemic, we have decided to fight harder instead of accept the reality that our biology is failing for our, our isolation from this nature, for our isolation from the adaptive information, the updates coming out of the virome, we've put ourselves in opposition. It's a stunning mistake that we continue to make over and over again. As we start to imagine spraying all of these antimicrobials and genetic you know, damaging stuff into the environment, we need to take a you know, careful look at what we're gonna to do to the cancer epidemic over the next couple of years after exposing the human population and cities to this level of damage. This study is, is showing the exact mechanisms by which cancer moves from a, a tumor to a metastatic disease that kills a woman. And it's through the loss of the methylbacterium rate of tolerance uh, that is a adaptive, protective mechanism around that human tumor. 
Uh, and so it's interesting to realize that without the microbiome, we don't have adaptation and, and immune system function to even fight tumors. And so as we increase the herbicide pressure, as we increase the antiseptic pressure on our environment, we're inherently going to accelerate cancer and other autoimmune conditions and other conditions of, of kind of cell-cell communication breakdown. And so it's a, a sad, sad day for humanity as we see ourselves in continued opposition instead of as the result of our nature. Cancer mortality, uh, many of you have seen these, uh, but we can show state by state that the more antibiotic we pour into the environment, uh, the more cancer death we see. And so these are the numbers that start to get me scared. And of course, the cancer mortality has really been focused over the last uh, 10, 15 years in the South. Uh, and so I want you guys to watch these cancer maps in the next couple of years with me to really keep an eye on things, because I think we're gonna see a huge explosion of cancer in New York, areas of California, Seattle, other hot spots of COVID, I'm expecting to see marked increases in, in, in cancer death over the next few years as we realize the, the correlation between our antimicrobial process and that. Glyphosate obviously being that common antimicrobial, I do want to remind you of its mechanism um, as it kind of enters our environment, both the food system, the water system, and now our air and rain systems all carrying this chemical. Um, is devastated, of course, the Midwest where we spray this molecule, and it's kind of led to this epicenter of, of cancer death down south. But I want to look across, you know, all of the diseases for a moment and realize that, you know, the leukemias that are all you know, being sued for right now against Bayer Monsanto um, are just the tip of the iceberg. Bladder cancers on the right took off at the exact same time, 1992. Uh, thyroid cancers, I'm sorry, there, and this is slightly off the screen. Liver cancer, same pattern there. Um, and you don't have to look at just cancers, but here's senile dementia. Look at 1990. We're on a, 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 a slow increase with uh, when, when adapted for age, you show almost no change in the prevalence of, of the, these neurologic conditions like um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's dementia. But suddenly in 1992, we leave the, the population adjusted green line and we start to see this exponential rise in, in neurologic loss of memory. And again, uh, we're going to go into a lot more detail with Dr. Pete Cummings on this, but uh, there's a striking relationship between neurologic memory and retroviruses and RNA virus uh, transcription. And so we're, I, I'm pointing to these maps to show you again and again, in 1992, as we started to spray wheat directly with glyphosate for the first time, we fundamentally changed our relationship to the world around us. And we now know that the viruses start to overexpress themselves in environments of cancer as well. So cancer is another sign of dysregulation of the innate immune system, as are the a rise in viral uh, uh, transcription within us. And so when we see virum rising, when we see cancer rising, we can be very confident that we undermined innate immunity in the 1990s. And we did that in 92 with wheat and 96 with corn, soybean, alfalfa, ultimately sugar beet and 30 other species of commodity crops now all being sprayed with this chemical. We have to really look at, at the relationship between an innate immunity. And if you look up innate immune system, the very first thing that you're going to find there is um, uh, the barriers are the first mechanism by which we do innate immunity. And as you've seen in many of my other lectures, glyphosate breaks apart our tight junctions. It breaks apart the gut membrane, the blood brain mem membrane, and the kidney tubules so that we're leaky sieve all over the place, the vascular tree, et cetera. So we turn into this leaky, you know, ba barrier free kind of milieu, and we no longer have that first mechanism of, of uh, innate immunity or relationship to the virus as we lose those boundaries. So I really think that we'll find again and again that where we find high spraying of these pesticides, we will see a high emergence of viromic information as we break down the innate immune system, not just of humans, but of the entire adaptive biology of mammals. We think of the protein industry and, and the like. So this is looking at the glyphosate spraying map across the world. Look at the amount of prevalence uh, that you have in Hubei. Hubei province uh, in the center of China here is uh, thought to be the highest spraying environment now in the world of glyphosate containing herbicides. Uh, the uh, chemical came off patent in 2002 and then again in 2007 to a bigger degree. And since then, uh, China has made the majority of glyphosate containing herbicides uh, we're all suing Monsanto and, and all of that, but in fact, every single chemical company in the U.S. as well as in China is making some herbicide with uh, a glyphosate compound within it. And so it's extraordinary prevalence now, this chemical. But now look at Europe, where you see the highest uses are in Italy. 
And if I had the map right now, actually I don't think I have next uh, to zoom in on Italy, you'll see that the highest concentrations in all of Italy are in Northern Italy. So very specific to where we saw high penetrance of COVID, we see these high, high spots. This is looking at pork production now instead of glyphosate spraying. So now imagine the, the pigs of Asia. The, Asia is the, the highest density of, of pork production in the world and Hubei province happens to be its highest uh, concentration in all of China. And so you have now mammals in the form of pigs that are being raised on intense antibiotic exposure through their feed and high, high levels of glyphosate spraying in the environment. This is why influenza every year starts in, in Asia here is because we are creating this level of extinction stress on the bio, virome and biology within China to force this massive adaptation gain of function effort every single year as we put this level of stress. Should we blame the communist government of China? In my book, absolutely not. What we've done as a globe is we've exported all of our most toxic manufacturing and cheap meat production and the rest to China. It's our consumer behavior that has made China the toxic you know, epicenter of the planet. And we should not be surprised and China should not be personally held responsible or individually held responsible for the, the crisis that we have with all the biomic stress that we're producing that is a collective consumer behavior. That is a, not a Chinese problem. That is a global problem. That is a global behavior that creates this type of environment within China. If we change our consumer behavior, we can radically change China. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to take a sip. This is coming back to something I pointed out earlier, is that viruses have been circulating the planet since the beginning of multicellular you know, animals, let alone humans. We have had a long spread, long standing spread of viruses around the planet to allow genomic adaptation and biodiversity to occur uh, we, with plant life, animal life, human life. None of it would have occurred without the ability of viruses to travel the world. They travel through the air as a primary mechanism. The droplets that everybody's putting their masks on and talking about and three feet away, six feet away with social distancing, that only controls for droplet spread of a virus. That is pertinent in the first two to four weeks of a pandemic. But within that four to eight week period, the virome has now traveled the world through aerosol and through aerial delivery, not through droplet delivery. And so now the only way in which droplets become pertinent is if you have an unhealthy enclosed environment where the droplets can really change the amount of viromic information. And so this is like if you have very close um, contact with a single individual over a five day period, your chance of, of being exposed to that virus increases some. Interestingly, we've seen almost zero transmission in, in, in the hospital settings. Even though we can find the virus in the, in the air ducts of, the, of, this, uh, of hospital systems in China and in Italy and the US, uh, those studies have shown that the virus is traveling through aerosols, but we see very little prevalence of any signs of infection or reinfection within hospital systems which suggests to all of us who've been reading the data that it takes a very high concentration of this coronavirus before we start to adapt any signs of, of imbalance with it. So it takes a very high delivery mode. So you need a whole lot of this in one space. Droplets can do that. So if you're around somebody and, and, and you're there sustained and you're able to breathe in enough of that, that may be enough for you to become ill. So the germ theory kind of holds up in a very small microsystem. But walking by somebody in public or walking in and out of a restaurant, your chance of getting this thing appears to be zero. Even walking in and out of a hospital room with somebody who has COVID has not re been a single case recorded that that virus can transfer through, through, the, through that uh, infectious process. So the germ theory doesn't hold up with casual contact or short-term contact. It takes you know, your roommate or your family member with high levels. And even in that setting, 50% of people in that room will never have an abnormal relationship to that virus. They will never mount a fever. They will never have any symptoms. They'll find their viromic innate immune system balance with that virus input, and they'll take that adaptive information and move forward with their biology, being more resilient in the future. A small percentage of people within that home will express symptoms on some level or otherwise. If you see high symptoms occurring within a family, it would suggest that that family's environment is so damaged that it's expressing this high level of imbalance with the virome. And so it's the food environment, it's the nutrient environment, it's the air environment of that home, rather than the presence of the virus that will predict the outcomes for that extended family. 
And so I want you guys to all realize that, that when we think that we're seeing an epicenter of germs, we're probably seeing an epicenter of dysfunctional biology. We're seeing an epicenter of lack of health created by a lifestyle and an environment that's, that created the vulnerability to that abnormal relationship with the virome in the first place. And so when we start to see these maps of Microsoft and this is how the virus spread from this point to this point, because this airplane traveled here and there, that is bogus. And then all the way down to the microscopic level, that is not how things are happening. We have a viromic event happening on the planet. The virus is real. I believe that. And I actually not even that terribly concerned is, is it made by a military lab or is it naturally occurring from pig stool? I think it's probably naturally occurring from the environment. But even if in the worst case scenario, if it's you know, manufactured in some gain of function lab, military lab somewhere, at this point, it's irrelevant. We have the pandemic, it escaped. We should have been able to keep you know, very good you know, communication with that, a balance with that virus no matter what, and most of us did. If it was a government attack, they certainly didn't figure out how to get by the innate immune system, which is reassuring, okay? And so the innate immune system in the population of the world survived and worked, it functioned. The number of deaths, as you've seen the CDC revise this recently, is down to just 9,000 in the United States that were purely due to the presence of COVID, as far as they can tell. All the other deaths, that 25% that of the millions of, uh, on the planet now, uh, those cases occurring in the United States that led to mortality were from co comorbid conditions, mostly cardiovascular disease, diabetes, end-stage renal disease, and the like. And so those, those uh, uh, mortalities can't really be presented to the, or um, blamed on the virus because they were pre-existing conditions. They died of those conditions, perhaps exacerbated by the virus somewhere in the mix. But to say that the people are dying from the virus is inaccurate. They're dying of their comorbidities. And so the CDC rolls that number from you know, hundreds of thousands back to maybe 9,000. And so a very small number of, of actual deaths happening in COVID in the United States. But again, we need to acknowledge that the, that in and of itself is not a symptom of a bad virus, it's a symptom of a bad deficiency in innate immune function. So thank goodness the immune system is as good as it is. I'm actually kind of shocked when I heard there was a new coronavirus and I'm thinking about, wow, how much more unhealthy are we now than we were in 2012 when we last saw a big coronavirus pandemic with MERS. I was fully expecting it to be worse than it was. And in those early days, I was relieved to see China, Italy, and the rest not express this thing to the, the, the full potential that it could be. If we do not change direction, and if we keep spraying herbicides and, and you know, in, you know, sterilizing our environment, the next pandemic is gonna be worse because we're undermining innate immunity. And I won't care if it's a government lab or a naturally occurring virus again, the genomic updates have to keep happening because we're putting an, an, an extinction level stress on, on the planet. It's gonna happen. So this is just a reminder that we've had evidence of airborne transmission, not respiratory droplet transmission since as far back as 2002, 2004 here with SARS. Uh, this is a demonstration of how uh, viruses travel. They deposit in, in atmospheric boundary levels. They travel in very high atmosphere and they travel bound to particulate. And the particulate they bind to is PM 2.5, the carbon particulate that we produce through our energy and transportation industries produces this tiny little carbon particulate called PM 2.5, which stands for particulate matter at 2.5 microns. And so, uh, and it takes a very small amount of this thing. Micrograms per cubic meter are expressed here in this map. And for every cubic meter of air, for every mic microgram of material in present, we see an increase in mortality. And so what you're gonna find out with COVID is that we can map PM 2.5 to every single hotspot that occurred and we can map that to the, to the traffic of, of that carbon material around the planet. And so again, you were told that um, somebody developed this in Hubei and traveled by plane to Italy and, plant, and maybe Seattle, and these were the initial cases due to human transfer. But I want you to show you what happens every single year, uh, starting in September, and this is September 29th, this is NASA data looking at carbon, and I want you to watch what happens as we move through here. I'm hoping I can figure out how to play this video without moving forward. Let's see here. There we go. So this is now November. Now we see the first cases. This is December. This is all the way to May and June. And now you see a reverse of the curve towards the end of this, the year. So this goes fast. So 
play it in slur again and describe what's happening here. So in, let's see if I can pause it here. So starting over again, sorry, this is so quick because I was trying not to waste your time, but now I'm realizing I should have slowed it down for you. So I'm gonna start and pause it here. So to November, October, November, December. And so you're seeing this jump over and over again. So these are the early months of the transfer. And there's this plume of, of carbon material coming across from China to hit the, the west coast of, of the US. And you see a plume of carbon material leaving New York and, and hit, heading over here to Asia. And you see another plume from Asia heading into, uh, I'm sorry, from Europe heading into Asia. So we create these plumes of carbon material that then seed the next location uh, with whatever material, whatever genetic information is binding to PM2.5, the virus is binding to that carbon, will carry the information. So we should have seen uh, first cases in Seattle and New York across this northern hemisphere as you watch this day-to-day, week-to-week transfer across the northern hemisphere. We should have seen very little cases through the south. So Los Angeles should have had far less uh, cases than, than uh, San Francisco and the like in those early phases. But as the year goes on, you see that the northern hemisphere starts to clear and it sweeps back across the, the midline of, of the uh, near the equator. And so then we should have seen southern cases. And so that's exactly what happened in the United States. We saw the swath across the top and then it swings back down and hits uh, Florida just a, uh, a month ago and then Texas and then LA and Hawaii now getting it. And so as that reversal of the curve happens late in the season, We'll see it. So we should have been able to warn cities in the northern part of the United States that you'll see a high prevalence for a short period of time of corona prevalence, and then it's going to dissipate, and then we'll see it swing back through towards the end of the season, uh, sweeping through the southern United States. All of that was predictable through carbon particulate and the way in which we understand viruses to be able to bind PM2.5 and travel in abnormal clumps. Before all this carbon material that humans were making, Viruses dispersed themselves very equally through the atmosphere. And there was not this like high concentration effect. Now we've created high concentration effects. And so the pandemics are starting to map not to the viral transfer around the world, but to the viral transfer and the concentration of PM2.5. Particulate matter that can abnormally clump this stuff so that when you take a breath, you're not getting a few viruses. Every cell could be seeing thousands of viruses. And so we can overwhelm the innate immunity or the, the apobec 3 a proteins and everything else because of our abnormal resp- you know, exposure rate, because of our abnormal uh, viral load on the particulate matter of the PM2.5. Uh, these are, again, hot spots. Again, in the end, we'll be able to track that this pandemic followed in cities that were very hot in PM2.5. I do want to show here that glyphosate has a huge impact on PM2.5. And so again, Mississippi River Valley that I showed you early uh, is encompassing this whole area, which obviously is not our big cities. We're not creating a bunch of carbon through uh, municipal transportation and energy. Instead, we're creating the carbon out of decay and uh, of fungal content within the soils and destruction of soil systems, as well as plant matter. Uh, Through the, the constant herbicide pressure, we're creating this massive carbon load in this environment. You'll remember that Louisiana was an outlier. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when the Northern United States was becoming uh, affected by the the transfer of the genetic information, early on in February, New Orleans was an unusual hotspot. New Orleans is the end of the Mississippi River and is the highest concentrations of glyphosate throughout the world. And so has the most compromised innate immunity in the world happens to be Cancer Alley from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, that last 90 miles of the Mississippi happens to be the highest rates of cancer in the entire developed world also was an epicenter of early on vulnerability, even when very small amounts of carbon were, should have been present there early in. The, but we saw, you know, Florida was much more resilient. Florida and Southern California and Texas, these spots didn't come into influence until you saw the re, uh, recirculation of PM2.5 across the South in June, July. And so with that late transfer, we should have seen New Orleans light up. So New Orleans lit up months before they should have, because of this devastating effect of glyphosate on PM2.5 prevalence, as well as the innate immune system breakdown. You know, deeper than, you know, as we go, as we like the influence of, of glyphosate again, we have to remember that it, it disrupts the shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway is important in innate immunity when we start to think about the immune system larger than the human. The human is, cannot have an intact immune system in and of itself. An isolated human has a diminishing immune system function. 
That's why as we see you know, higher and higher industrialized uh, environments create more and more hygienic environments for our children, we see higher rates of autoimmune and immune adaptation failures in those children. And so things like eczema, allergies, asthma, and autoimmunity in our children in the United States is going through the roof as we get more and more hygienic. It's because we're in less and less touch with our real plant life and microbial life. And the, the microbes and the plants make the medicines that would treat the asthma, the eczema, and everything else through the shikimate pathway. So they create many of the critical amino acids necessary to make uh, the, um, the building blocks for the proteins that would go on to be the medicines within our food, as well as our own neurotransmitters and all kinds of hormones. And of course, the glyphosate breaks down that, that barrier, that tight junction system, as I referred to earlier. And so we're losing our innate immunity through all these mechanisms. Mother Earth, of course, is always patient with us. And we find out that the bacteria and likely the fungi and the protozoa and all the rest of them are making these carbon molecules. And so these carbon molecules, in contrast to PM 2.5, which is a dead carbon molecule, you can imagine it like a piece of coal, which has no oxygen binding uh, and communication left on it. PM 2.5 is now a toxin. The precursor to PM 2.5 are these complex living, living carbon structures that are biologically active coming out of the microbiome. And this is, of course, what our lab has been working on for the last seven years. And these are the communication network between the cells. This is how cells figure out how to do regeneration and adaptation with the insert of, of a virus. You need coordination of human cellular systems, you know, complex inflammatory cascades and everything else. And all of that is orchestrated by the carbon matrix made by the bacteria and fungi. And so it's an exciting time where we're starting to realize that when we talk about innate immunity, we have things like the apobec proteins and things like that uh, that are made by human cells that keep us in balance with the biome. But at a larger level, at an ecosystem level, the bacteria and fungi within our soils, the, the plant um, cellular mechanisms with shikimate pathway and all that, and the plants that we consume, all of those are part and parcel to or contiguous to what we would call the immune system. And so I'm hoping that by the end of this, you're starting to get to a sense of genomic information is continuous throughout all of nature. We cannot get away from it. 10 to the 31 viruses in soil, water, and air. We can't get away from that. 10 to the 31, by the way, was 10 million times more than our stars in the entire universe. Are the viruses just in the air, just in the sea, just in, 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 the, in the soil system? So it's over and over again, millions and millions of times more than anything else we can really imagine is the genetic information. And we are in balance with that because the ecosystem creates the communication network and the coordination of systems such that all of the species can thrive together and always be in communication and adaptation through the biome. All right, that's just a quick look at the ability of the bacteria and fungi to rebuild that innate immune system. When you take the terahydrite compounds and put them into a dietary supplement across the gut membrane, you see this failed barrier system zipper itself back up into a coherent uh, protection membrane. So again, if you read innate immunity, the first thing you're going to read is barrier systems. And these tight junctions are the fundamental protein for that. And it's very cool to find out that it's not a human system that turns on the expression of tight junctions. It's actually the bacteria that have this powerful pathway to you know, invigorating this first step to the innate immune system. This is some of our published data, just looking at the dramatic increases in protection. So this is looking at something called TIR, the transepithelial electrical resistance. And you see this leap, this doubling of, of the protection membrane when you put that communication network in, into place. This is looking at its ability to reverse the damage from gluten, as well as the glyphosate shown earlier. This is looking at the blood-brain barrier. Uh, when gluten or glyphosate hit the gut, it leads to this collapse of the, 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 uh, uh, the blood-brain barrier. If you protect that, you see this multifold 4x improvement in protection across the brain if you have the microbes uh, in communication. So really, very cool demonstration of the power of this. Mitochondria, it turns out, are dependent in their production of energy through a protein called actin. And this study here is showing the impact of glyphosate on destroying actin filaments. I don't think you're going to be able to uh, you know, tease out the details actually at this uh, resolution here uh, showing up on the screen with this light. But uh, suffice to say that uh, as you add glyphosate, you lose the entire extracellular and intracellular matrix of, of the actin filaments. And in so doing, you undermine mito mitochondrial life. And so just as mentioned earlier, we're poisoning the environment with antibiotics through glyphosate for our soil systems. But as soon as we consume glyphosate in our water and food systems, we undermine the microbiome within us, including the mitochondria within ourselves. 
All right, I'm gonna jump forward here. This is looking at the transfer of energy from cell to cell and really emphasizing again that we are not too indifferent than fungi. And so uh, between our cells uh, are the gap junctions. The gap junctions traffic uh, light energy, uh, the, the, the light energy made by mitochondria, this huge electromagnetic field that's pumped out by mitochondria is transferred from cell to cell through these tubules, much like the, the micro, mycorrhizae at the plant rootlet between the, the mycelium of the fungi and the plant itself, everything coming into to, to kind of fruition in that space. And so that's the, the transfer of information that we have moving across the system. And this eloquent uh, control leads to the, the development of life, whether, whether it be plants looking at supporting that communication network, we can move from three and a half pounds of tomatoes to 32 pounds of tomatoes by supporting that communication network. The movement of light energy from soils into plants into humans is how vitality happens. And so as we really take pause at the end of this talk and consider the miracle from which you come, I want to emphasize that the whole matrix is here to produce an energetic event. The whole matrix of bacteria and archaea and protozoa and, and fungi have been building a viromic information stream that's allowed for adaptation and biodiversification to happen on the planet. And we're now moving into this reality that if we can embrace that, if we can come to terms with the fact that we are made from viruses, from the intelligence of nature as a whole, we are the culmination of biology on the planet, we are not here to, to destroy it, to extract from it or the rest, we may have the opportunity to move into the most creative capacity that humans have ever can, imagined when we start to see, bring ourselves in line through our consumer products, through our technologies, through our transportation, information streams, when we bring ourselves in line with the biome instead of against the biome, when we bring ourselves in line with soil architecture instead of against it in our agricultural systems and beyond, we will see an explosion of life and intelligence on the planet because it's happened after every one of the other extinction events. Life gets more complex and more biodiverse and more intelligent for the damage done because the virome happens. The virome is the record of increased adaptation, increased biodiversity, increased capacity for human biology to happen. I wanna thank my entire team and the extraordinary team behind the scenes with Jesse, Bjorn, and the like helping this whole day unfold so seamlessly. Thank you guys for that. In preparation for the coming weeks, uh, you know, I want you to think about how you can engage uh, with our team. If you want to learn more about your innate immune system and how we see it interacting through your daily lifestyle, how you start to set that in, in function, we do have a, an education seminar that's called the Intrinsic Health Series, with the understanding that intrinsic health, your innate immunity included, is inherent to your capacity for regeneration. And so we've developed a four-week uh, group course called Biology Base Camp Community Connect or an eight-week individual course where you have one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and in both of those, the Intrinsic Health Series will give you the opportunity to engage uh, with uh, our coaching staff and uh, more than eight hours of content from me, as well as a ton of multimedia content, both written content and more uh, video content beyond that, to understand how you are inherently programmed. And so this is a resource to you, but I want you to understand that whether you go after that resource or not, your nature is defining your biology. You are the result of your nature, and so get out in it. If you haven't seen our Breathe Your Biome thing, get out across our Instagram, Zach Bush MD, and, and uh, hashtag Breathe Your Bio Biome series of images of people around the world that are realizing that their health is founded in the nature they breathe. And so get outside and, and really you know, enjoy and consume uh, what we have there. And I think you're going to get a, an incredible experience across the board of uh, a new capacity of thinking about yourself in relationship to viruses and bacteria and the rest. Finally, I want to bring in uh, Pete Cummings. Uh, Dr. Cummings is uh, joining us because of all of you. In our first town hall last month, I made a call to action for you to support us through our GoFundMe site uh, so that we could start to hire up a, a global education staff to bring this level of education, this level of in-depth dive so that we can start to combat the fear of the, of the current media with really quality education, really quality presentation of materials, both through our website at Zach Bush MD, as well as through our newsletter and beyond. And so Peter Cummings and his involvement is a direct relationship and a direct result of your support that came in that first town hall. We raised $10,000 to our goal of 250,000 to hire up an entire team. And so very excited to introduce Peter Cummings. Peter, please jump in and, and give us a little insights into uh, how your, your path crossed with mine. 
Oh boy, that's going back, Zach. We have to confess to how old we are. Uh, thank you so much for such a great lecture. Every time I see bits and pieces of this, it, it still just blows my mind. It's incredible stuff, Zach, and I'm very thankful to have reconnected with you. And Zach and I were fortunate enough to do our residencies at the same time at the University of Virginia. Uh, I won't give a date, but it was some time ago. Uh, and it, I'm very, very pleased to have reconnected with you uh, over the last several months. And it's been it's been really a transformative experience for me to, to rekindle that friendship. And I, I thank you very much uh, for including me in all of this. And reading the comments and questions as you were talking, obviously you've picked up an incredible group of people to follow you. There's some very insightful comments and and uh, very excited to engage with with many of the people that are that are interested in, in, in what you're trying to do. It looks like a, a great group. Uh, briefly, uh, and I'm, I don't have the gift of brevity, so I'll try to be brief. I know we're, we're getting late, uh, but uh, I have three board certifications. I have anatomic pathology, forensic pathology, and neuropathology. And what that means is I basically study death and how people die. And I'm particularly focused on the nervous system and in the brain, which is the neuropathology component of it. And after about two decades of doing literally thousands of autopsies and dissecting thousands of brains, I became very jaded and disillusioned and saw the, how disease was ravaging the human body and how diseases like uh, heart disease and diabetes and obesity were affecting people at younger and younger ages. And I was signing death certificates of people who died of heart attacks in their 30s and 40s when they, you think of that as being an, an older population of people. And I think every day I was putting complications of morbid obesity on a death certificate. And I just felt like a bean counter as, you know, somebody standing outside a house fire, not doing anything. And I think when people get involved in medicine, there is this drive to help people. And I didn't feel like I was doing anything. And uh, as I thought through that process, it became very, uh, very obvious to me that uh, two things is that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, many diseases that, that affect people are preventable, and they're preventable by lifestyle modifications. And the second revelation I had was that medicine has it backwards. And I, I've been teaching in medical schools for 20 years, teaching anatomy, and you know I see how education works. And we spend so much time talking about illness and disease. I mean, how many classes did we have, Zach, on wellness and health? Um, I don't think I ever had a nutrition course. Um, and we, we focus all our attention on sick people, and we should be focusing much more attention on keeping people healthy and well. And so I came up with the philosophy of lifestyle as medicine and how you can modify the things in your environment to keep you healthy and, and help you live younger, longer is sort of where, where, uh, where I'd like to go. Um, that thought process really started me on this transformative journey that that really, for me, underscored the importance of relationships, the relationships that we have with each other as humans, and the relationships that we have with the world around us, whether it's plants, animals, uh, microbiome, everything, it's, it's very connected. And, and uh, to, re to respect that relationship uh, is, a, is paramount to the survival of our planet. And so one of the things I'm really interested in is the role the environment plays in the development of diseases and how those diseases can be prevented. And your PM 2.5 stuff, it really does blow my mind because you could overlay any dis human disease on that same pattern and draw back to PM 2.5 and the classic environmental problem with human health. Uh, I sort of have a side jam, a little side passion that Zach brought up I, because of my neuroscience background. I, I'm very interested in human consciousness, especially the duality of human consciousness. Um, having dissected thousands of brains, I can't point to where consciousness is. There's no anatomic site for it. So I'm very interested in the connectivity of consciousness, where consciousness comes from, how it forms, um, and how that interrelates with the human mind's ability to, to understand and comprehend time, which is very important for memory formation. And, uh, I guess I'll wrap it up with through my journey and reconnecting with Zach. I've kind of come up with a mantra for my life and, and I would like to approach the world this way now is that, that I try to treat everyone who I encounter as though they're a guest in my home because we are all guests on this planet. And I'm uh, very, very pleased to be a part of this, Zach. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you for coming to us from the lake in Maine. Uh, congratulations <laughs> to your family to uh, find, your, find your new lo location to breathe your biome. And so good luck in, in your continued relocation there.
And we're just so, so thrilled to have you on the team. Uh, the information you carry is going to blow minds as we start to look into the, your neuropathology background. And um, our understanding of the brain is, is just as paradigm warping and shifting as our understanding of the biome. So, uh, so thrilled to have you aboard. I'm excited for this audience to, to be really uh, blown away by you and, and everything you bring. Uh, many of you are asking if this is recorded. We've recorded this whole thing. It'll be made to you available as it gets uploaded in the coming weeks to my website. Um, you will also be able to share that with friends and relatives sending them to the website. They can just sign up to their email and go uh, through that pathway. If you've enjoyed what you've heard here today and you're excited to have more people like Dr. Peter Cummings joining us and uh, imagine a whole team of physicians and scientists leading a charge on a new way of thinking about the world that we live in for a, a sustainable and regenerative future for humanity. Uh, we would ask for some, your continued support. You can go to our GoFundMe site uh, for our Global Education Fund and uh, uh, click there and donate anything you can afford. We're so grateful for all of you and the couple hours that you've donated to this time. Thank you for all the great questions that have come up and I apologize I haven't been able to integrate those in real time. Uh, to answer those questions to you in this period of time. So I will come back to you with a, a separate uh, presentation of my responses to those qu questions in the future. Uh, but I'm very excited to stay engaged and, and answer those questions in detail because it's through your continuous feedback that we will really enrich this experience for, uh, for Peter, myself, and everybody else on the team as we continue to learn from you and your curiosity pushes us to new efforts to communicate more thoroughly and at a deeper and more profound level of consciousness. So thank you for being a part of that mission. Thank you for being in our fungal network and uh, staying engaged. And we look forward to the next town hall in the months to come. Take care and best of health to you and your family. Thank you, Dr. Peter Cummings.